<laughs> we have a couple of uh, two more little mini sessions a couple other ladies one of the first one will be kiki anderson and she's got a wonderful beautiful testimony of how the lord saved her and brought her even to first baptist here um and the lord also recently brought her through um i would say <laughs> May I, t I, I, I'm sorry, I got distracted. Um, the Lord brought her through some very, very difficult times with cancer and how the Lord is healing her and just a lot of things. Her husband happens to be a Minneapolis police officer, so he works up in the third pre third precinct up in Minneapolis. So we, we need to be praying for just all of the whole entire situation and just praying that the Lord will, will be honored and glorified and, and take care of people everywhere. And I'm um, going to just have her come up in just a moment. Then right after her, my sister Denise, who lives in Tennessee, uh, we I had actually wanted Denise to come after she came home last summer. And I was talking with her. Um, it, Kimberly mentioned her father-in-law passed away a year and a half ago. And Denise, um, going as a young young lady who lost her husband and I was just so amazed that of a girl and she'll tell you her perspective I'm not even going to steal the thunder here but Denise grew up here in Vergrove and came to school here from second grade through 12th I believe is that correct and went off to college and met, met, met Mike Fletcher and married him and they were almost married 30 years so the Lord had different plans but the Lord is working in Denise's life in an amazing amazing way and I think that she has some a blessing of her perspective also so Kiki if you'll come and begin and then Denise you can follow right after hello my name is Kiki Anderson and my family and I were members here at First Baptist Church and like Valerie said, my husband's a police officer in Minneapolis in the first precinct downtown. He did work third precinct uh, for 11 years, um, the precinct that was burnt down. But um, he is downtown now, and he's been a Minneapolis police officer for 23 years. We've been married 22 years. Um, I'm also a, a teacher here at First Baptist School. I teach middle school, high school PE, and seventh grade math, which I love. Um, the season that I will be, that I've been asked to speak on is the season of sickness. And like Valerie said, cancer came home in January of 2019 for me. Um, at 46 years old, I was diagnosed January 2019 with cancer, specifically large B cell non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And what might have been devastating news for some came as a rescue mission from God. My cancer was not a shock and it was not a curse. It was a lifeline, a literal, blatant, on purpose rescue from my God and Savior. I'm honored that Pastor Claire would allow me to share my testimony of how God worked in my life through cancer. And I've prayed that this time with you would be profitable. I pray that you would walk away edified, fortified, and encouraged. Many of you who are moms or just busy women will be able to relate to my story. If you are going through a season of busyness where you are tired and can't catch a break and feel like your priorities are all wrong, and deep down you know that your hectic life you are living is not pleasing to God, I invite you to learn from my mistakes and determine to make the necessary changes that you, so that you can start living a life that is an align, in alignment with God's will for you. I would say that the most eye-opening moment in my cancer journey came actually a couple months before I was diagnosed. I stood in my kitchen and remember thinking around Christmas, and then th or Thanksgiving and then Christmas time that I was so tired from the hectic, stressful, nonstop life I was living. And I stood there and said out loud, if you get cancer, it's your own fault. 
Again, this was two months before diagnosis and before any symptoms whatsoever. And I told my th myself this on three occasions, at least. If you get cancer, it's your own fault. I never actually thought I would get it. Some of the commitments I was part of at the time of this self-fulfilling prophecy, if you will, were the following. I was a middle school, high school PE teacher, which I am today, a seventh grade math teacher, which I am today. But I was also at the time a Thursday church secretary, a school, school, our school secretary substitute, the assistant junior high JV and varsity volleyball coach, Wednesday after school youth soul winning chaperone, Wednesday evening discipleship mentor, marriage counselor, Saturday church school janitor, teen Sunday school teacher. There's a few more, but you get the picture. All this on top of, on top of being a wife to my husband and being a mother to my four children. And um, I'll just add that I have a son who was diagnosed with autism when he was three. Um, and being married to a police officer has its demands. And um, those of us who are married know that just being married has its demands, right? God really expects us to be a helpmeet to our husbands. That's not a suggestion, but a command. And as you can imagine, um, my time was limited because I wanted, one of my mottos at the time was the Andersons, I'm looking at my daughter, we finish what we start. And if I committed to be a janitor, I'm going to just commit to be it. I don't know how long it's a commitment for, but it's going to, we're going to finish what we start. And the Andersons aren't quitters. But if you take on 20 things that you shouldn't be doing, um, your energy, you're going you're gonna to run out of, of energy. <laughs> I would like to make clear, though, that I don't blame anyone, especially my church or those who asked me to take on these responsibilities. I blame myself. I could have and should have said no thank you when others asked me to do more and more, but some of us have a hard time saying no, don't we? Any of us out there? Okay. okay. It's not in our vocabulary. We don't want to seem unhelpful, but the truth is that we need to do only the things that God wants us to do. You don't need a season of sickness like cancer to be able to finally get your priorities in alignment with God's will for your life. God knew that in order to get my attention, he would have to bring me to my knees with a disease that would cause me to give him my full attention. And cancer did that in a hurry. Simply giving me the flu or another broken ankle wasn't going to cut it. Just as a side note, through the years before cancer, the Lord opened my eyes to the importance of nutrition, so I became that person. My colleagues, my teachers, uh, friends here know me. Um, like Mr. McKinney, Tiffany's husband knows that I'm trying to feed him kale all the time and stuff like that. Um, kind bars, that kind of stuff. Oregano oil to help him. You know, just uh, Pauline, where are you at, Pauline? Got her hooked on oregano oil. But um, <laughs> I'll talk to the rest of you, too, if you have any questions. But, um, but, but, but through my son's autism when he was three, I, I set off on another journey of learning about GMOs, high fructose corn syrup, MSG, refined sugars, artificial colors, soda pop, soda being evil. I said that for the Minnesotans, pop. I'm from California, so we say soda. But that was me. But even being mindful of nutrition for the last 14 years could not fend off cancer. And I had many of my colleagues say, you were the last person I thought would get cancer. I knew I was drowning in commitments in school and church ministries. My husband would say from time to time, you can say yes to everyone but me. And that's not good, wives. If you've ever heard your husband say that to you, stop right there, get on your knees, and ask God to help you say no to your commitments. 
In my heart, I believe that I was doing the best I could to raise children to know, love, and fear the Lord. I'll give you one example, just when I was asked to do the janitor job, because it was kind of one of the last things um, I needed at the time. Um, I was asked to do the job, and my mind was screaming, no. It was just N-O-O-O. And as I sat there and said, yes, I think we can do that. And um, those Saturdays, even though I was with my children cleaning the building, it was uh, four hours every Saturday that I just didn't have that time. And I actually felt guilty that I wasn't at the Saturday soul winning. I, we went to the Wednesday soul winning, but I, I really felt guilty that I couldn't make it to the Saturday soul winning. And I really, um, you know, it, it's just interesting how, how the Lord leads. But so, but the truth was that I was deteriorating. On top of this, I was getting between two to five hours of sleep per night. Can anyone relate to that? I hope not because... Um, I bring this up because as far as health is concerned, sleep is vital to good health. We are not machines and we need rest. I urge you to get enough sleep if you are in a similar rut like I was. In early January 2019, I began to feel a pain in my chest. And as a PE teacher and being active and joining my PE class, which I love, um, I just figured... You know, I'm healthy. I just got this pain in my chest. I chalked it up to heartburn. But after five days of heartburn, off and on, I began, to, I began to think it may be some sort of heart issue. One night while sleeping, I awoke with a massive pain shooting from my chest. The next day, I called my mom, and she encouraged me to make a doctor's appointment. So I called, and the nurse I talked to told me to go directly to the urgent care. But, of course, I couldn't because I had worked that day. So I went the next day when I had a rare day off from class due to it being finals week. But the schedule is all switched up. So I walked into the clinic that morning at 8 a.m. The receptionist asked me what I needed to be seen for, and I told her for mild heart pain. They took me in immediately. A funny story about this. There was a lady in front of me, and she looked just horrible. Her, she looked green, and she must have had the flu or something, and I was behind her you know, just dressed and ready to go in line. And she asked the receptionist, how long is this going to be? And she said, well, you're third, so it'll be, you know, however long after three people. So when I walked up and I said, I have mild heart pain, because I just didn't want to make a big deal out of it. I was shooting pain out of my chest, but, you know, mild heart pain. And the doors flung open, and they're like, try to fill this out as you're walking to the room. So I'm trying to fill it. They had the monitors on me before I had the paperwork finished. Um, I had, let's see, where was I? Okay, so I walked into the clinic that, eight, that morning at 8 a.m. The, the receptionist asked me what I needed to be seen for, and I told her for mild heart pain. They took me immediately, even before all my paperwork was even finished. They then hooked me up to the monitors. They took blood, and the blood work was abnormal, so I had a CT scan. I waited in the room for the results that I figured would be nothing. The doctor came in and said, your heart and lungs look great, but we do have an answer. You have a four-inch mass on your mediastinum, and um, mediastinum is the sheath around your heart and lungs. And being a kinesiology major, I thought I knew everything anatomy. I'd never heard of the mediastinum. Who knows what the mediastinum is? Okay, good job. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, I was like, what's that? And we are looking, he said, at lymphoma or thymoma. As I sat in my car in the parking lot, numb, I thought about the possibility of my children not having a mother. I thought about how I have a my husband and parents waiting to hear from me on how my doctor's visit went. And I have to tell them I have a tumor in my chest that is most likely cancer. I couldn't speak, so I texted them the results. My mind was so numb that I remember having a faint thought that I'm supposed to be leaning on faith somehow in this moment. But as I look back now, I know that the calm I had speaking to the doctor and the calm I had as I sat in the car that God was right there with me. And not only that, but he had ordered these steps. I didn't call it 
a rescue immediately, but I began to understand his allowing cancer in my life for my good. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And I stole that verse from Nadia um, Shaver and um, praying for her every day. But she wrote that on her Facebook um, post, and I stole it because it's right and it's true. What we go through, our trials in our lives, that is the will of God for you. So trust. Trust him. In the end, my husband encouraged me to get the chemotherapy treatments because this type of cancer I had had a high chance of being cured statistically. I didn't want to take chemotherapy into my body, but after prayer and a piece, I did five rounds of chemotherapy. It was Michael Pearson, if anyone knows him, who came over in my house the night before I was to have my first round of chemo, and he sat with me, and he prayed with me, and just was a blessing. I'm grateful for all the people that love me through uh, cancer and through the chemotherapy treatments, but he just kind of explained how, because being like a naturopath in my thinking, I couldn't imagine putting mustard gas, because that's what it is, in my body. And for having a, the doctor said you have a healthy heart and healthy lung, well, lungs, well, that wasn't, it was going to start to strip those away. It affects all your organs. So Michael did help me um, that night and just put my mind at ease. God sent him. Through my treatments, God blessed my family with such encouragement from our church family, co-workers, family from my home state of California, friends, neighbors, prayers, gifts, cards, gift cards, dinners, calls, texts. And I could, and I thought about the people that don't have this type of support at the time. I remember thinking, I feel so loved. I feel so supported. I would like to publicly thank right now the family or families who gave financial gifts to help pay our school tuition bill. Every big gift, every small gift, every prayer, my heart rejoiced. It's a great feeling to know that you are loved, cared for, and prayed for. I'm gonna, just going to read through because I'm at my limit. So, um, so after the five rounds of chemotherapy, I had a final CT scan that showed that there was no evidence of lymphoma in my body. God has given me a second chance at getting my priorities right. We all know as Christians that we are to put God first, our husband second, children third, and others and work, etc. next. Not last, but next. I cannot stress enough how important that order is. God has used other trials in my life to continue to show me the importance of that order. As far as commitments, God allowed me to keep only the ones that fulfill the desires of my heart. Um, and the last verse I'd like to leave you with is um, just a lot of truth. First Peter four twelve through nineteen says, "Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when His glory shall be revealed, you, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy." Thank you.